Welcome everyone to another episode of the Highly Relevant Podcast with yours truly, Jack Rico. This is our 17th episode and on this show, we tackle the lunacy of what was the Donald Trump news conference this week with The Atlantic's David Graham. From Trump's harsh comments of CNN and BuzzFeed, what will be the future of these media organizations in the next four years? We also discuss Barack Obama's farewell speech with Salon.com's Chauncey De Vega and his article, Farewell, My Black President. He was there at the event and will discuss if history will vindicate Obama's legacy, will Donald Trump destroy it, or will Obama stay politically active and defend it? And what are the most anticipated movies and TV shows of 2017? I'll share with you the list I announce on the Today Show this week. Donald Trump's first news conference this week since being elected president of the United States was nothing short of combative. It was a fight with a clear opponent, the media. I think it's a disgrace that information that was false and fake and never happened got released to the public. As far as BuzzFeed, which is a failing pile of garbage, writing it, I think they're going to suffer the consequences. They already are. Can you give us a question? Don't be rude. Can you no, give I'm us not a going question? to give you a question. I'm you, not going to give you a can question. You can you stay categorically? You are fake news. Sir, Go ahead. can you stay categorically that nobody... CNN and BuzzFeed were the clear targets due to the latter company publishing unverified documents revealing alleged Russian blackmailing video on a future sitting president. It set off an ethical and divisive discussion amongst editors and journalists about the real threat the media industry faces under the Trump administration and with themselves. To discuss these matters in depth, I'm joined by David Graham, staff writer at The Atlantic who covers U.S. politics and global news and who has already written two articles about this news conference this week, including the trouble with publishing the Trump dossier. David, thanks for coming on. Thanks for having me. Why has Trump been so obsessed with the media? I don't remember any other president-elect or soon-to-be president being this consumed with it. I think it's really an obsession that dates back long before he was in politics, and, and you see it in his career in business. You know, he's a guy who has always understood the power of the media and, and used the press to sort of spread his name and renown uh, a great deal when he was a businessman. You know, I talked to him a couple times before he was in politics, and it was incredibly easy to get a hold of him for uh, the chief executive of an organization controlling the sort of assets he did. And that's because I think he recognized the importance of, of being able to get his name out there. That means that now that he's in politics, he remains totally obsessed with these things and, and very concerned about what, you know what the media does and what it says. The press conference really had uh, about three crucial takeaways. One was dealing with Russia and his relationship with it. The other one was about the conflict of interests uh, of his business. But the one that seemed to really be the most salient of them all was Trump kind of bashing CNN and BuzzFeed and creating this firestorm controversy around the media. Now, you've written an article uh, about the BuzzFeed issue. What impact will Trump's comments, do you think, positive or negative, have on CNN and BuzzFeed moving forward? Well, I think in the immediate term, something that's interesting, uh, and a, uh, my colleague McKay Kaplan's wrote about this, is, is it serves to sort of divide the media a little bit. As long as the debate in the media over the publication, it sort of lets Trump off the hook a little bit. You know, it's hard to know. I, I think it's a little bit strange and and um, and disconcerting to have the president attacking news organizations like this and and sort of assailing them. And and you have um, his incoming spokesman threatening to throw them out of press conferences. Um, yeah, and I think in general this does tend to have a chilling effect if people are afraid they're going to be lambasted by the president uh, on live national television. Let's talk BuzzFeed. Was Ben Smith right in publishing these documents? I think it was a mistake. I mean, I think it was a well-intentioned mistake, and I thought his explanation was interesting. But I, I think that it's uh, you know just highly questionable to uh, publish a set of allegations like this that they, as they admit, they couldn't stand behind. They weren't saying they weren't sure. They were saying we haven't you know we haven't really checked these out, but we think everyone should have a chance to read that. And I think that's a fairly thin justification. It's thin, but there's some truth in it. So uh, did you see the Chuck Todd interview that he did with him on MSNBC? 
I did, yeah. And so, you know, here's the thing, is that us as the media, we do have certain responsibilities and there are certain truths, but as soon as we start attacking each other, we're never going to get to the same place because I think there's a common cause here. We're being attacked by a president that is threatening the freedom of the press overall. Just because some of them um, are not being attacked and some are, that doesn't make it right. I think we're all a unit, we're all set, whatever affects me will ultimately affect you. And I think that sort of chain reaction isn't necessarily being heard, and I think that um, ethically, there's a problem right now, and I think it's very divisive. What do you think are some of the solutions that we can do as the media moving forward in this Trump administration? I mean, I think it's a great question, and and I, you know, I don't really know, I don't have a good answer. Um, Trump seems to have just confounded the press, uh, you know, at, at every turn. And I think there were expectations throughout the campaign. Each thing would be the thing that would take him down and each report. And, and what we've seen is that those things don't do anything. You know, they're able to uh, undermine his standing. He enters as a pretty unpopular president. But but I think other than, say, you know, reporting as, as um, aggressively and honestly as we can, I don't I, I'm not really sure what the answer is. And, and I hope. I hope other people can come up with one. <laughs> Do you think Ben Smith's job is on the line here from BuzzFeed? He's the editor in chief. I don't think so. I mean, I, I think you know Ben Smith is a widely respected journalist. Um, he's he's a very smart theorist, and and I think people may disagree with his decision. But I, it, you know, I, I would be surprised uh, if it had longer impacts on him. Uh, you know, I, I think the bigger impact is, is likely the systemic one. And and one reason I worry about publishing a report like this is. Because you know BuzzFeed is saying they can't stand behind it necessarily the, the the you know the facts in there it allows Trump to say well this is all just fake news and then any time anyone whether it's BuzzFeed or the New York Times or CNN or the Atlantic or anyone else um, can you know brings revelations about Trump Trump and his allies can say well this is probably just more fake news and I I, I worry about the sort of ripple effects of um, of information that is not entirely nailed down. David Graham, staff writer at The Atlantic, who covers U.S. politics and global news. Thank you very much for coming on the podcast, David. Thanks for having me. We have just a few days left before President Obama leaves public office, and his emotional and candid farewell speech this week was a reminder of the class and statesmanship We're losing in Washington. I am asking you to hold fast to that faith written into our founding documents, that idea whispered by slaves and abolitionists, that spirit sung by immigrants and homesteaders and those who marched for justice, that creed reaffirmed by those who planted flags from foreign battlefields to the surface of the moon, a creed at the core of every American whose story is not yet written. Writer Chauncey DeVega from Salon.com was there, and he joins me on the podcast to discuss his article, Farewell, My Black President, and his thoughts on Obama post-presidency. Chauncey, thanks for coming on. It's a pleasure. So um, let's get into this. You were there from the article that I read. You were there at the speech that he did uh, just a few days ago this week. What was your initial reaction when it all ended, did you were you nostalgic? Did you want to cry? Did you feel that uh, your life ended? What were your initial reactions? Well, as I was leaving, I was you know being observant. I watched a very interesting encounter that I think encapsulated a lot of the sentiments there that TV editing and lights and perspective probably won't give you. So, with the many other thousands of folks who were leaving, I was in the press area, so I was cold and in the back watching all the CNN folks eat the good pizza and the good food while I had nothing. <laughs> so that's just my complaint. Looking at Anderson Cooper get his yummies, and it's like as I said, you know, watching how the sausage is made. So we're all walking out. It took about ninety minutes to get out there, get to the train, and there was an older African American woman next to me, and she had to be in her late mid sixties, very distinguished. And there was a Brazilian reporter talking to her, and he said to her, "Can I ask you a question?" She said, "Yes." And he said, does this make you feel better? Do you feel hopeful about the future? Does this make you feel positive? And she looked at me, and I looked at her, two black folks acknowledging each other. And I smiled, and she said, no. Wow. And then he simply couldn't understand. He's like, what do you mean? This was amazing. And she said, no, I'm not more hopeful. Situation is horrible. So I had originally gone there with the expectation I would leave the event, walk downtown, but it was raining. The Secret Service took my umbrella. 
and I'd stand outside Trump Tower and drink my favorite beer and curse him. <laughs> I read that at what the he's end done of your article. to this country, what he promises to do to the world. And I said, you know, uh, Brother Barack Obama, that wasn't his message. Barack Obama is always as eloquent and careful and professorial. And I was thinking also, too, maybe that's part of his weakness, is that in this moment, we need someone to have that anger and that rage about this authoritarian fascist. But as Obama knows, and black folks, black men in particular know, he's not allowed to communicate that way, because then he becomes the angry black man. So I'm proud of Obama. I admire all that he did in the face of willful opposition and white supremacy from the Republicans and others. But take whatever you think is going to happen in this country with Trump and multiply it times two or three, it's going to be that bad. So no, I don't feel any more hopeful. Do you think that history will vindicate Obama's legacy? Absolutely. Um, I think he's going to go down. You know, Political scientists and others have these rankings they use for presidents in terms of their accomplishments. I think history will be very kind in many regards, Affordable Care Act. Um, rights for gays and lesbians. Obama does have this neoliberal colorblind approach to thinking about race. As the old expression, I think it was Michael Dyson said, you know, Obama runs from, the, uh, runs from, wa- runs from race the way that young black men run from the cops. <laughs> uh, we actually have some good empirics on that, but Obama has actually talked less about race in matters of the color line than many other recent presidents. But I think the sum total of his achievements will be looked upon very favorably. And again, it's the benefit of history and hindsight to see, and I would dare say as a political scientist, I would say we got to put him up there in the top 10 easily. I mean, he saved this country from a second Great Depression. Were there things I wish he would have done, like lock up the Wall Street banksters? Absolutely. Um, do I wish he had been stronger, more robust in terms of taking on the politics of austerity? Of course, but he's a Rockefeller Republican. That's his DNA. And that tells you a lot about the racial animus of the Republicans, that they go after a man with such intensity. Yeah. When many of his policies are the ones that came out of the Heritage Foundation or that Mitt Romney supported or that Republicans not too long ago would have been enthusiastically for. Yeah, like he could have been the perfect bipartisan president, but you have to kind of take into account that he's black <laughs> mm-hmm. in a white uh, Republican uh, uh, group. How do you think he did on race? Because this has been to me the tenuous part of his presidency where I felt like he never fully directly – uh, confronted that with what many African American folks and many minority folks expected from him. How did you think he did in his speech with that? I think I was very moved and, and smiled and laughed when he called out white racial resentment. And when he also gave that little history lesson, and I call them the Trump thuglicans, to these racially resentful <laughs> white folks who voted for Donald Trump. And they're not new. Donald Trump is just the result of 50 years of the Southern strategy. He's not an outlier, he's a Republican Party when he talked about sort of the history of whiteness and white ethnics and how the rhetoric and stereotypes that were used to describe the Irish, Italian, Poles, Russians, Jews, and Greeks, and other white folks from Eastern and Southern Europe is the same language and rhetoric that has been used to describe African Americans and now Hispanics and Latinos. I love that. And I also like the little wink, and I'm not sure many folks, and I talked about it in my salon piece, got this, when he's talking about fake news and anti-intellectualism and connecting that to the Enlightenment and the Constitution, because Republicans love to talk about the framers and the founders. But it's funny, I don't even think they've ever read the Constitution. They certainly haven't read the Federalist Papers <laughs> or anything from the Enlightenment. But back to race, I think he, he did wonderfully in terms of symbolic politics. There is something so eminently powerful about seeing a black family in the White House. And that was sort of, in many ways, because it wasn't policy, the stimulus for the hateful backlash he faced. So symbolic politics matter. His neoliberal colorblind approach, all you know, lift all boats. Uh, The water rises. We all do better. Well, no, black folks and brown folks are still on the bottom of the ship. So empirically looking at housing, mortgage rates, wealth inequality, et cetera, black folks and Hispanics and Latinos to varying degrees are doing just as bad, if not worse. But Obama inherited a horrible, broken economy and he got no assistance in terms of correcting it. But he was also hamstrung. And I always point to this example because I can't wait to read Obama's uh, book in 30 or 40 years and he tells the truth. But all well, the that's going to be juicy. Thinking. It's going to be awesome. I hope it comes out sooner rather than later. So I've been pretty mixed about Donald Trump's feelings towards Obama. Um, as we saw from the BuzzFeed dossier uh, and the documents there, he hated Obama. And mm-hmm. the reason he went to the Ritz-Carlton was to somehow in some manner desecrate you know, where he was in the space that he was at that suite uh, in bed with the uh, all the vulgarities that he did. Um, but then, you know, he was on the Today Show one day talking to Matt Lauer, and I mean, the, the superlatives that were coming out of his mouth, and I just, I, I, I don't know, maybe it was the encounter, the power of the electric energy that he has in, I mean, you've been there, you've, you've seen him in, in, um, in person, 
um, he radiates a level of charisma that's just very powerful. So maybe he got caught up by that. But ultimately, he is out to destroy Obamacare, to destroy a lot of the policies he established in the last eight years. And overnight, he could just literally wipe out his legacy. Will Obama, in your opinion, stay politically active and defend his legacy as a citizen? Well, to the first point very quickly, I, I, Donald Trump is a sycophant and a bully who seeks out power. So he liked Hillary and liked, he liked Hillary, for example, when she invited him to the wedding and other events, but then she turns on him. Donald Trump has no respect for Barack Obama. Um, he wasn't caught in a glare. He is angry at Barack Obama and has been ever since birtherism uh, and before. And Obama has handled Donald Trump's childish racism um, with grace and dignity that I can't imagine having to sit next to that man in the White House, a man child about to take over your position, who hates your black behind. But what will Obama do? You know, he and his wife, probably a lot of work with foundations, certainly. Uh, he doesn't have the bully pulpit of the presidency anymore, but perhaps he could be like Jimmy Carter, mm -hmm. right? So Carter did so many, amazingly underrated president, in my opinion, has done so many things out of office. And I think Barack has some plans. I think he's going to go, he's going to recharge, he's frustrated, he's done his best, he tried to save us from ourselves. And in many ways, he was a president who was too good for the American people. You know, and that's the joke, right? Donald Trump is the president the American people in many ways deserve. And now they're going to get him. And with that said, Chauncey DeVega from Salon.com, thank you very much for joining me on the podcast. Thank you. I had a chance to go on the Today Show this week to share my personal list for the most anticipated movies and TV shows of this year. Have a listen. Here to break down all the upcoming movies and television shows we have to look forward to is this year is the editor-in-chief of showbizcafe.com, Jack Rico. Hi, How Jack. How you doing? Okay, I'm Happy excited. New year. Happy New Year. So there's so many movies yes. out that we actually broke them into categories. Let's start with action, adventure. What do we have to look forward yes, to? Yes, so, I mean, we got Fate of the Furious. We got John Wick 2. We got Kong Skull Island. But I believe <laughs> that the most anticipated action film of this year is going to be The Mummy. You got Tom Cruise, Russell Crowe, starring in this reimagined reboot of The Mummy franchise. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's one of those movies that when you see these two stars together, they give instant credibility and star power mm -hmm. to this film, but it's the large, intricate scale action sequences that ultimately will make this more of an oh. event than just a summer film. Yeah, that looks fun. You got to see that one in the theater. Okay, now Absolutely. family films. I'm the mom of two. Yes. What can we watch? Well, you got the MG movie, you got <laughs> the Lego Batman movie, you got Pixar's Coco, but I think that the movie that everybody wants to see for this year mm -hmm. is going to be Disney's live version of Beauty and the oh, Beast. Yes. Emma Watson stars Lin Manuel as Manuel Miranda wrote it, right? Yes, Didn't well, that was Moana in particular. But oh. In this one in particular, uh, this is Alan Menken's soundtrack, and you have Dan Stevens as the Beast. And so everybody, this is almost like a fan cult-like attraction for this film. Uh, the trailer dropped, 127.6 million people saw yeah. this. A lot of interest for this film. Is this for little kids or not really? This is little. It's not as dark, but it's definitely one that all the families can okay, come cool. together for this film. All right, now comedy. <laughs> Let's go there. I believe it's going to be Baywatch. You got Dwayne The Rock Johnson, <laughs> yes. Zac Efron <laughs> starring in this film. <laughs> Film adaptation, which is more of a comedy mm -hmm. than it is more of a drama. Right. And I got to be honest with two things that everybody's talking about David Hasselhoff, Pamela Anderson are going to be making cameo yes. appearances, and Zach Efron's physique. Everyone's talking about how ripped he is in this. Very strict diet he had to go wow. just to do this role. Uh, so a lot of commitment, not Let's just all fun. Let's go back to Zach Efron's physique. <laughs> just kidding. Uh, everybody's talking about it but me. All right. Um, to get me out of trouble, let's move on to romance. Or no, 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 superhero. Superhero. So there's so many superhero films. Uh, you got the new Wolverine movie, mm -hmm. the new Spider-Man movie, the new Wonder Woman movie, but it's going to be Justice League. This is DC's answer mm -hmm. to Marvel's The Avengers. Right. It has Superman, Batman, Aquaman, Wonder Woman, The Flash, Cyborg uniting to fight uh, this one supervillain. Expect a lot of money, but also a much lighter tone to this outside of uh, Batman vs. Superman, which is a little too dark. Right. Okay, you know who's going to love that? Al Roker, finally. Sci-fi. <laughs> Sci-fi. Well, you can't go wrong with uh, Blade Runner 2049 mm -hmm. or Alien Covenant. Okay. How many you have? Scott. You are really an encyclopedia. But I got to be honest with you. 
I think this is the year, the most anticipated film of 2017 mm -hmm. is going to be Star Wars Episode Eight with Carrie Fisher's last appearance on film and Luke mm -hmm. Skywalker returning to the franchise. Uh, this could be the highest grossing film of all time come December. It's going to be one of the most anticipated films all of the All right. Year. We hear it here. Highest of all time. Okay. Head on over. Right. Come on cool. down. Chanel, she's in the orange You don't room. even have any notes. This is all just <laughs> in your head. I'm so impressed. Well, there's a lot of great TV coming yes. out, so let's dig right in. First of all, all right. we'll start with um, a series of unfortunate events. Netflix is doing yeah. 26 episodes with uh, uh, Lemony Snicket's, and you have Neil Patrick Harris starring as Count Olaf on this, uh, where he's trying to take the inheritance money of three orphans. It's a little dark, so okay. it's not just for kids, but for Look adults, too. Look at how too. he transformed. I know, right? Looks great. That's great Neil makeup. Patrick Harris? Look at him. <laughs> um, next up, we have Sneaky Pete. Talk to me about that. Giovanni Ribisi, Amazon's doing these great TV shows now, and this is more of a crime drama about a con man who stumbles upon this family with a lot of surprises. How about Powerless? Powerless. Now, this is Vanessa Hudgens, and she's starring in this uh, NBC sitcom that takes place in the Batman universe. Oh, okay. So think of Gotham from Fox, but the complete opposite, and this is the one that uh, everybody's going to want to watch. Big Little Lies. Big, I mean, this, you don't even need a plot for this. <laughs> HBO is uh, uniting uh, Reese Witherspoon, Shailene Woodley, and Nicole Kidman so in nice. one single show. Wow. These are three movie stars, so yeah, just them. Yeah. And then Iron Fist, obviously, that's going to be huge. Yeah, Iron Fist, uh, this is the fourth Marvel superhero. They're bringing them together on Netflix to do the Defenders, and this is the one that every superhero fan Good job. I don't know watch. how you just put all you that in it. your head. And that brings us to the end of our 17th episode of the Highly Relevant Podcast. I want to thank Chauncey DeVega from Salam.com and David Graham from The Atlantic for being on the show. And I hope you like the show. And if you have any questions, please reach me on Twitter at Jack Rico Official and give us your feedback on the show. Talk next time.